showtime. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? This is Adam Pecora, and this is Requiem for a Tuesday. How's it hanging? We got a big one today. For real this time. The Better Call Saul finale has been seen by me, and no more obstacles are in my way for me to talk about it. So I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to say it all. I'm going to risk it all for you. Uh, (laughs) Rate, review, and subscribe to Requiem for a Tuesday. Apple, Spotify, you know the gist. Uh, That was weird. Uh, (laughs) Follow me on Instagram at adam.rfat. You can get the merch, rfat.bigcartel.com. Still plenty of it. Uh, Emphasis on the rating and on the subscribing and whatever. Everything's linked in the description below. You can check out Microwave Minutes, new season actively out. Um, Against all logic and recommendations, uh, that show also comes out on Tuesday. Probably at the same time. I don't know. Nobody ever listens to me. Well, (laughs) literally, including the show. Uh, What? Anyway... Let's dive in, because that was horrible plugs. They're they're all there. Go check them out, if you're so inclined. There's music, there's fun stuff. Anyway, let's get into Slip and Jimmy McGill, shall we? Listen, we're just going to start off with the hot takes. This show, front to back, is better than Breaking Bad. I got to say it. Like, the highs aren't as high, but the lows aren't as low. And the highs are still very, very high. Uh, Basically, this show takes all the meat from Breaking Bad and applies it into itself. It's like Breaking Bad was the trial run. And they knew what they needed to cut out. Now, I'm not going to say what needed to be cut out of Breaking Bad. I think, you know, come on. The last two seasons of that show are pretty unassailable in every way. But man, Better Call Saul is just... It's just next level. Because they manage to keep you just as invested. And the show is just as high quality. The writing's just as good. The stakes are pretty much just as high... You know, there's not kids involved, I guess, would be the only difference. And there's way less just straight up action. There's way less overall violence. It's done purely through drama. And I mean, a lot of the action in Breaking Bad was pretty so-so anyway, you know, like it was, you know, whatever. We're not going to get into that, but there's less brutality in Better Call Saul. Obviously, it's the origin of what was to come, so that's appropriate. Um, and the the brilliance of it is simply, like, we know what happens to this guy once he meets Walter White. So how the hell, like, it leaves you with the same thing. How the hell are they going to pull off this ending? That's what you wondered about Breaking Bad. And yet again, just fucking crushed. Just absolutely fucking crushed. Um, So, I mean, for those of you who don't know, if you haven't watched it, I'm not going through every fucking season beat for beat. Um, But it's, you know, it's set before the events of Breaking Bad. His name is Jimmy McGill, not Saul Goodman. Uh, He's got a brother who's a lunatic and runs a very powerful law firm. He starts dating a woman at said law firm, becomes his wife. They start running scams together. Anyway, the backstory is Jimmy McGill was a big scam guy in Cicero. He moved out with his brother. Shout out Cicero. Not really, but you know. Uh... (laughs) And he moved 
out to New Mexico with his brother to get his life straight and become a lawyer in his footsteps. His brother never really accepted him, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I never liked the brother character because he just weighed down the show, but, you know, you needed it. That's the thing. I feel like the early seasons of Breaking Bad have the problem of, like, they're setting everything up. So, like, what goes on isn't as engaging necessarily. This show kind of suffered from that. It just, it, no matter what, it had to start with smaller stakes in order for you to believe when it's at the larger stakes. And the show's still very good in the initial seasons, but it's way more reliant on the brother-to-brother combination, but he's trying to get his whole life off the ground. So, of course, he's not in with cartel members and doing all this crazy shit yet. So, my point is... While I'd like it to reach where it gets, I understand that it needs to build everything from scratch the same way. Um, and it is fascinating how far everything goes. and it happened, But it happens so smoothly and makes sense within the drama and story of the show that you almost don't even notice the scale of it go up. And you kind of don't even realize some of these things that are happening until the show confronts them themselves. It's just masterfully done. And the same thing is Breaking Bad with all these incredible little shots like for no reason. Like, oh, they're making coffee. Let's put a cabinet in the microwave for when they need to put a muffin in. And that's how they open the fucking microwave. Or, (laughs) you know, whatever. All the little shit like that. Oh, somebody's getting a pair of shoes out of the closet. Let's make a first-person perspective camera view of the shoes as they're being grabbed. You know, it's just really investing in the quality and craft of everything. And boy, does it get my dick hard, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, (laughs) So also, the show does a great thing of doing these flash-forwards to post Breaking Bad life uh, at the end of Breaking Bad obviously he's with Walt and they're getting their new identity they're effectively they're in criminal witness protection you know where it's being run by some guy Um, of course shout out Robert Forrester who played that guy and uh, he gets shipped off to Nebraska to be a guy named Gene who ends up working at a Cinnabon, which is funny that that's how that worked out because that was what he said, like, best case for me would be this, and then he ended up doing it in Breaking Bad. Great stuff. And so, boy, I believe at the beginning it was just, like, once a season, or maybe it would be the first episode and the finale. They would just do a black and white, flash forward, really subtle each time and it was just like oh here's gene doing a thing and then that would be it and you're like fuck what what happened you know we all just really want to know what happened and those get a little more frequent as the show goes on but not too much like they stay pretty disciplined with not really revealing that much i think partially because they weren't worried about that like they didn't think about any of that um, I remember Vince Gilligan saying at what is it? it has to be the end of season four or season five, part one, whatever, uh, where Walt is at the Denny's. It has to be season five, part one. Yeah, the end of that. Uh, and then he meets the guy, whatever. He opens up the back of the trunk. And there's the big gun. And he's like, yeah, we didn't know how we were going to get back to that point. But, like, we knew that's where it wanted to go. So, like, we figured out the rest later. And I feel like that's partially what they were doing with these flash forwards. Like, all right, he's in Nebraska. What's he doing? What's the reason? How is that all going to connect together? Eh, We'll figure it out. And I feel like that's how that went. Uh, if it was pre-planned, all, all the better, you know, either way. But I I think that they had a, a lot of show to focus on either way. Um, 
they had to figure out how they were going to start from one point and end at Breaking Bad, right? Um, and boy, again, they really just fucking nailed every part of it, and it's it was so thrilling to watch. Uh, so anyway, up to season six now. I'm going to go a little bit episode by episode. I'm not going to waste this whole hour on this. Don't you guys worry. I know you saw the title. We got more goodies to come. Um, So anyway, episode one starts where the flash forward is the government seizing everything from Saul's house. And then it basically cuts back and it takes or it goes right from where season um, five left off. And it's Nacho on the run. So basically, there's two characters in this show that have survived from the beginning. It's Nacho and Kim, and you're both like, well, what's going to happen? And they've done a great job of building the tension of like, oh, they just keep alluding to like, oh, Kim's going to die or kill herself or not. They haven't alluded to that, to her killing herself, but and it just adds to more of the show because, you know, she's not around like when this show ends, she's not around. And given that there's deeper involvement with Gus Fring and the cartel and Mike and whatever, you would think that she's going to get killed by somebody. But then it's like, well, why would he keep working with them so friendly? He's very clearly very in love with this woman and he loves that they can do scams together and she gets a little kick out of it and whatever. Anyway. So, essentially, the whole beginning is showing the end of Nacho, right? So, Nacho's on the run because they're trying to kill the head of the cartel. What's his name? Lalo. And Lalo gets away. So, it's basically like Lalo's trying to come back and kill Gus because Gus sent Nacho to kill him and that didn't work and whatever. Um, And, essentially, that's just Lee. Nacho can't outrun everybody and he he kills himself uh but in a standoff he knew he really had no way out and it it just wasn't going to work out um kim formulates a plan to so this goes all the way back to like early early parts of the show there was the settlement with old people at an old folks home that were being mistreated and they got a class action going and Jimmy had to bail in order to help the actual people and he had to make like a sacrifice for that or whatever. Anyway, so that's all still going on. And she comes up with a plan to discredit Howard who runs the law firm that Jimmy's brother had formerly started. And then they basically begin a really long con into ruining this guy's life. And so Jimmy plants Coke in his locker. And then that leads to them setting up in a really clever way. It looking like he's dropping off a hooker somewhere that people would also witness. And there's maybe one more. Anyway, we'll get to that. I'm going episode by episode still. Sorry, sorry. Um, And then... Lalo, yeah, Lalo makes his way back and hits up Gus, and he's like, I'm going to get you. Um, the whole second episode, again, just continues all this. They just keep chasing after Nacho. Um they bring back another old character, the tax people who were frauds. I don't really remember that whole plot line. It was very early. Uh, but they're getting they're trying to get them to sue Howard because he is a cokehead, basically. And they still try and it just it doesn't it doesn't work because they are criminals and it's all stupid. But it's it starts it starts the forward momentum of getting to where we need to go. So then once Nacho kills himself, unfortunately, uh, that is also when they swap his car out and do all of that. And then they get Huel. That's what it was. They get Huel to duplicate his car key and they steal his actual car. Because I couldn't remember. I was like, I know that Jimmy just dresses up like Howard. But I was like, how do they get a second exact car? 
Um, they duplicate the key to his car and then steal it. They get Wendy, the hooker, to play along with the whole thing, and he throws her out of the car, and people witness it. Really clever stuff. And then uh, somebody parks in the space that they reserved, which was Howard's space, and he has to park into like uh, just one of those like uh, slanted line, you know, like do not park here things, and then moves the sign at the last second so Howard wouldn't notice. Uh, great stuff. Great stuff. Nice little comedy in there. They work the comedy in beautifully here. I mean, and who better to do it than Bob Odenkirk? You know, it's it's really excellent. Um, yeah, so then Lalo kills himself at the end, and then we really start to move forward from here. Sorry, Nacho, not Lalo. Uh, this is when the sh- this season really takes off after here, and granted, it was all very entertaining before, uh, it was just a little cartel heavy, and we kind of just, that's a thing where we knew where that was going. There's no Lalo involved. The cartel guys don't get to retire. Like, we knew Lalo was getting killed. Um, they just did a great job of extending it. Now, the, the way in which he escapes his assassination attempt is absurd and silly, and I didn't really care for that that much. Um, but at the same time, you know, Gus Fring gets blown in half and then walks out of a room, you know, it's just impactful stuff that they're trying to do. Sometimes you got to go off the wall. It is, it is a show at, 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 you know, the end of the day. So what happens next? Ah, yes. So they, the courts start rejecting jimmy basically every time he goes in like nobody's talking to him ever nobody's looking at him nobody wants to help him with anything basically it got out that lalo was lalo not just some undocumented guy and everybody's pissed that he defended him but now this is where saul really starts to kick in now of course at this point of the show he is practicing under saul goodman it's been that way for a season at least uh roughly i don't know exactly whatever uh, and so now that his clientele of criminals is really picking up, it was, he was doing it bit by bit, but like struggling to get them, you know, he basically had to set up scams just to get clients. So now it all worked out to where they're actually coming to him. Uh, and then Kim is being driven around, but she finds out that it's just Mike's guys. And they're basically like, we're, we have you on watch for Lala. Like we're trying to protect you. And now they're both scared that she's coming back. So basically what happens is Lalo tricks them into thinking that he's going for Gus and they send everyone after him, but really he just goes to the lawyer's house to figure out what happened. And well, actually before that, what happens is Lalo goes to fucking Germany and meets the woman who dated the guy that built out the underground lab, which is where breaking bad ends up taking place. Of course, And he finds out then where the lab is going to be. But somehow Gus knew that already. And knew that he would meet him there. But regardless, that's what happened. Uh, (laughs) He goes to Germany, finds out that the lab is there. Then he goes back and he tries figuring out what happened as to who tried to kill him. Doesn't get anything. And it's a whole thing. We'll get there. Um, this is also the episode where Howard gets confronted and then he, about his recent behavior, like with the Coke and hookers, then he invites Jimmy into some gym and like they box it out and Jimmy's like, what? And then he has someone follow him around and I don't know if anything ever really comes of that. Um... But yeah, so when I said Gus somehow knew, he hides a gun in the fucking laundry because he like knew Lalo was going to come there specifically. I I mean, a little silly, but also like you don't get to where you are if you don't have good instincts like that. Um, Yeah, they hire the PI and nothing comes of it. 
and what happens is basically in part of their big scheme to fuck over Howard, um, they have an actor impersonate a dude so they can show it in the footage, and then they find out that his arm is broken, and she's on her way to Kim is on her way to handle some like really important case, and she bails because she cares more about the scam and turns around in the middle of the fucking highway. And they like fix their fake video so it looks like the dude's arm is broken. I don't really remember all the details for that. Um, and then you find out that the PI was working for them to begin with. So he was in on the scam. And then the guy like when he shakes his hand like gives Howard drugs. And then at this meeting uh, he looks like he's freaking out because he's all fucked up and then they're like yo are you good like seems like you're on coke again and he basically goes off and starts screaming about how it's all like bribery and how he's being fucked over by jimmy and it all sounds crazier and crazier so it just like really really works again basically and then that's when the Gus thing happens. Everybody diverts, and then they actually go. Lalo goes straight to Jimmy's house, and he basically tells him that you guys have to go. You have to go kill Gus, and Jimmy's like, "Nope, have Kim do it." And now Kim should have just left. I don't. I'm pretty sure that he's like Kim should do it because he wanted her to drive away. Um. And also just like, yeah, like just not be in this room. But she actually goes and tries to do it. Which is crazy. And then she just explains it to Mike. And Mike is like, wait, none of this makes any sense. Why the fuck would you do this? And that's when Gus realizes that it was a double diversion and, you know, they weren't actually, ex- Lalo was not expecting that Kim or Jimmy could actually show up and do it. But I'm pretty sure that he wanted her to just drive the fuck away. Um, maybe he knew that it was just a diversion. I don't really know. Like, Jimmy knew. I don't know. Uh, but I don't know why she didn't just flee. It seemed like he was signaling that to her, but whatever. Uh, and then she almost tells the cops, but is too afraid. And it, it's really good. Uh, but then Gus ambushes him at the laundry trying to figure it out and kills him. So uh, the thing. Oh, right. The thing that I left out is. Howard goes to their apartment to confront them about the whole thing and they try to play it off like whatever. And he's like, no, listen, like, I know you guys are behind this, like you're fucking terrible people. And then Lalo comes in and just shoots Howard in the head. So they really, really, really fucked everything up. (laughs) It was crazy to watch. Um, And that that was how the first half of the season ended. But obviously I watched the whole thing all the way through. So that would have been even crazier otherwise. Um So, yeah, then they kill him, and then that's it, and it's great. They, they, uh, there's a whole thing where it's, uh, cartel stuff going on, uh, (laughs) but they bury it under the laundry, the bodies. So, he's then able to convince the cartel that it's not, and that's why he has, that it wasn't his fault, and that's why Lalo's death didn't affect the relationship, and he has the relationship with the cartel that you see in Breaking Bad. And this is when everything really changes. So, after the events where Howard dies in front of them, and all of that with Lalo, and all of those things, they basically finally are in the clear um, of all of these giant problems. But 
Well, first what happens is at Howard's funeral or memorial service, whatever, they find out that because Howard died, they're going to change everything about the law firm, including removing the name McGill from it. Even like, you know, Jimmy's brother helped found it. And you can just see the heartbreak in him that basically after all they went through to try to just get what they want, none of it worked out and it ruined his brother's legacy which is basically the entire reason his brother hated him to begin with is because he knew that something like that would happen maybe not that specifically but you know what i mean basically that he would ruin the mcgill name and he literally took it off of the law firm and he's also the reason that his brother died too uh so effectively no it's that's what's crazy about the saul character even with walter white it's kind of the same thing they're both doing terrible things to people the whole time and treating people horribly the whole time and you just keep rooting for them <laughs> you just keep rooting for them and then this is when the question is answered we just keep wondering like okay what's happening with kim then so she's not getting killed by the cartel she leaves him and it is devastating he gets home and her bags are packed which I mean, that's how you leave somebody, I, I got to say. It does work. You know, you really get the message across. Once the bags are already packed, it's like, what, I'm going to unpack all these bags? You know? That's, I already have the upper hand here. That's too much work. It, that's embarrassing, you know? Can't do that. Uh, and yeah, she's like, yeah, this is fucked up. Like, we're terrible. Like, we're bad for each other. And I mean, she kind of right. And then she just leaves. And this is the one critique I have. It just doesn't work. They just cut a hat and he's in the Cadillac and has the office that's fully decorated that you remember from Breaking Bad. And I get it. Basically what they're saying is nothing interesting happens in between here. His business just builds and he decorates. So, but that's what led him to go fully committed to just being a scumbag. Basically, she kept keeping him in check with these things throughout the whole thing. Like, what about this? And she's like, that's tacky. That's lame. Whatever. Have some fucking class. Be a lawyer. Be respectable. She was always there to check him on that. And I guess things really went off the rails once he left is the idea. Um, and then from there. That's pretty much it. Then we go into flash forwards. And we basically learn that Gene befriends local idiots who want to be criminals that recognize him. And they run bigger and bigger schemes at the mall. And basically one of the guy's moms gets suspicious, finds out who Saul is. Which is, and it's also kind of his fault that all of this happens again, and he gets caught and is put in prison. Now, they also do quote unquote present day stuff where they show some things you haven't seen before within Breaking Bad, where he is interacting with Walt and Jesse. Uh, to me, none of that was really that interesting, frankly. Uh, it, it was all fine. They didn't like do any like blasphemous things or whatever you would want to say but uh it just didn't work for me that much but that's fine uh and then the finale so he calls kim and they do the call in silence and he slams down on the phone and they eventually go back to do that and basically kim's in another state looks completely different is like married to somebody else and um what does she say Basically, you find out that um, she is confessing to Howard's murder. Or, well, she didn't murder him, but you know what I mean? She's going to tell the police what really happened. Um, there's... She, you know, she's trying to get him to turn himself in in the past. They show that. That's what I'm referring to, actually. Uh, she comes back so they can get the divorce finally. And then she drives to Albuquer Albuquerque and talks to Howard's wife and tries to get whatever. Tries to get that put through the system so something can happen. Um, maybe, maybe because she thinks it'll bring him out of hiding in Nebraska. I don't know, but he's not caught yet when this happens. Um, 
And then they keep doing this burglary scheme and it gets way out of hand and that just keeps going and then that's when he gets caught. So there we go. Caught up. I missed a little bit there. Hopefully that made sense. Whatever. Uh, and then he tries to run. It doesn't work and he gets caught and is arrested. And then it seems like, well, he's he ends up getting offered a plea to only do seven years because he has a he has like an airtight line about how he's one of Walt's victims and it and they know it would play in front of a jury so they offer him seven years and he's like oh no we're gonna try to get less and he makes it seem like he has all this new stuff and then that's when he finds out that Kim filed that about Howard's death and so he's not able to try to give them another body for even less time and then he lies about having new testimony involving Kim so that way she'll have to show up. And I guess one, basically once he realized that Kim was going to, like, was trying to get ho- the truth out there about how and all that, he realized he doesn't he he can't keep doing this he can't keep working on schemes to whatever and he needs to just do the right thing or whatever maybe he just wants to like impress her finally in one final act or whatever because he's fucked over everybody else so maybe just do it do right by somebody once however you want to look at it um and then once she's there in court he actually confesses about to everything and gets 86 years in prison And then they have a cigarette together. And that's how it ends. And the ending was great because there wasn't this big moment. Nobody just died. Uh, It was this guy was a huge criminal. It all caught up to him and he went to prison. And it's sad and harrowing. And the fact that I mean, the fact that she had the cig with him is just like nice. I mean, it's not like they're back together or anything. He's never leaving that place. Uh, whereas like Walt at least got to die on top, which is what he wanted. And, uh, just really impactful stuff. You know, I kind of got all my praise out of the way at the beginning, but man, it was just beautiful. And there's no other way I would have wanted it to end really. I mean, what, like the fact that Gene just starts his name's Gene in Nebraska, if I didn't say that. The, the way that Gene just starts getting into all these crazy-ass elaborate schemes. Like, they were trying to rob a cancer patient, and everybody in his crew was like, dude, we're good. Like, you can skip this one. And he's like, nah, you don't... Sk-. Like, he was trying to be like Walt to them. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, you don't you don't want him to... You don't want him to lose, I get it, but he needed to lose. It was not good. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, but or he was not good. The show was fucking perfect. The ending was great. Uh, don't really have any notes about anything that happened in that entire last season. It was a fucking ride. I watched it in a sitting and a half. Wouldn't even call it two sittings. Uh <laughs> And way better than that Breaking Bad movie. You can go listen to my episode on that. I hated that movie. This did all the right things in many different ways, much more creatively. And you could go either way. You can watch all of Breaking Bad and then watch this, or you could try to watch this and then watch it into Breaking Bad, and it would almost work either way. From what I gather, this is the end of the saga of these characters, as it should be, frankly. And uh, I loved it. Thank you, Vince Gilligan, for 125 amazing episodes of television all together. Uh, and it's an incredible story, and we don't need to do any more. I hope that they stick to that. All right. Let's move on to some fun stuff. Um, Let's do Scream 6. We said we would. Um, right off the bat, let's get the flaws out of the way, okay? First of all, I hated that they rebooted the last one. 
and they just called it Scream. Even though it's still a sequel, it's a requel. We get it. They talked about that in the last movie. Like That's the premise, that it's a requel. But why just call it Scream? It just it didn't make sense then, and it especially doesn't make sense now that the sequel to that one is Scream 6. So it goes Scream, Scream 2, Scream 3, Scream 4, Scream, Scream 6. Doesn't make any sense, okay? I hate it. Can we retcon the title, please, to just make it Scream 5 and stylize the S as a 5? It's all you needed to do. That's how all the other ones have been. Like, if unless the plan was to kill off all of the original characters and just move forward, whatever. So that's my argument there. And I will say, just like the just like the previous one, this one also doesn't build the world very much at all. Now, since this is a sequel to that movie, this one doesn't need to. But they barely did a good job of introducing the characters in the first one. But the ones who survived and are part of the main cast now it's like okay i kind of know them we get that they're friends and i understand the dynamic it just wasn't presented very well in the previous movie but in here the shot out this one's just shot out of a cannon and really just starts going and it doesn't need much plot the last one needed a lot more plot it needed to give me a reason to care about anybody and i didn't and i still didn't really care about anyone in this one but the set pieces and the action and the stuff is all there and we'll get to that as i go through the movie but i just think overall it has the same it lacks the same things as the other one but it just works so much better in this one i really didn't like scream five very much at all you can check out the episode on that as well uh something i liked about this one they brought in a character from the fourth movie which kind of wasn't really talked about much in the fifth movie which i think is substantially underrated i believe i did a rankings uh last time so check that out anyway there's some interesting stuff that happens here so first of all they do the opening kill as scream movies always do and they're always you know five ten minutes very visceral very intense and this one was very good too it was um a woman looking for her Tinder date and her response is are very dumb. You know, it's basically like, Oh, look in the alley. And then you look in the alley, there's nothing there. And he's like, I'm in the alley. And she's like, I don't see you. And he's like, Oh no, I'm in the alley. You know, stuff like that where it's like, well, I definitely wouldn't go down this alley, but either way, an interesting way to bring that all together. And basically it turns out that this lady is a professor at the college that, uh, Sam and Tara are their names the characters from the first movie anyway they do something really interesting with the opening kill where the killer then goes home and or the killer immediately takes his mask off and melds back into society so this one is now set in New York City so an interesting thing about New York City is that that's something that's very in- like doable theoretically you know what I mean uh it just kind of works. But, and it's like, oh, they're doing something totally different here. Like, again, we're going to switch up the formula entirely. Like, we're going to know who the killers are at the beginning. That's a fascinating way to look at doing one of these. However, you basically just learn that it's a longer term open, and these guys are trying to be copycats in the vein, and they just wanted to kill their teacher. Uh, But the bigger plot overall, or the real ghost face who's going to be the killer in this movie then just kills that guy. And that's the cold open. Is that, oh no, the killer actually is out there and we don't know who it is. Um, So you realize now that they all live in New York City and it's a shoddy job of New York City, right? Like, the college campus doesn't seem right. It just looks like a regular college campus to me. I, I haven't been to all of the college campuses in New York City, but, you know, still didn't seem right that there was just like a full quad. I don't know. Uh, but, like, they needed it because they have a great subway scene and a great uh, 
I don't know about great, but they have a pretty good bodega scene. So, like, they use elements of it, but it's like the logistics aren't right. Uh, it doesn't make sense that people would need to go from, like, you know what I mean? Like, where they are to where they're they're saying they're going. How long would it take? That type of stuff. They kind of seem to get wrong. And it just bothers me because it's just like it's a grid system. You know, like anybody, you don't need to live there to know this stuff. It's just like if you tell me you're at this street and then you say you're going to this other street, you know, just whatever. There's things when they're traveling that just don't make sense or where they're located wouldn't look the way that it looks. Even remotely, you know, they don't try to disguise enough, whatever. It's nitpicking, but still, I I should say it. Um but it, it mostly doesn't need to be set in New York, but it does for the key moments that they use. So it make uh, I back it. I back it. Um, so yeah, they're all hanging out. Listen, Chad and Mindy, the twins, whatever they are, they should have died off in this movie. We'll get to that. Basically, what happens is they're being chased around New York. There's a great set piece at the beginning where basically that opening kill, they find the main girl's ID, and so she's called into the police, and then when they're leaving the police station, her phone rings, and it's her boyfriend from the last movie who killed everybody, and she's like, what the fuck? Uh, And that's when they end up in the bodega, and it's really intense, and I mean, they're using fucking, like, shotguns, and it's really gruesome. I will say the police response time a little bit questionable there, but either way, really good. And you find out that the mask is from a, uh, the from Scream 4, I believe. And they're leaving... Ma- you find out in the opening kill, though, that they have, like, multiple ma- of the actual masks that were used. Um, and then Gail comes in. She, you know, uses exposition to explain why Sydney isn't going to be in the movie. And it's very clunky and obvious. And then immediately... They're getting attacked in the apartment. This is almost like, is this like one to two nights? Like this doesn't, this goes by very quickly. It might even be the same night. I didn't even really think about that. If time was passing in between. Um, and then they're in the apartment and they get attacked there. Now, the problem with these last two movies is that people get stabbed really gruesomely and aggressively and then survive. And I don't care for that, frankly. Um, But essentially, what happens is then Kirby from the fourth movie is somehow now in the FBI. Whatever. It's dumb. It doesn't make sense. And they all work together and they find out that somebody has this old abandoned theater, which how do you own all this? A point that I've read multiple times that's fair. And it's like a shrine to both Stab and the real events of Scream. And then... Then I believe the subway kill happens, which is great. They use black and out lights on the subway. It's Halloween. Everybody's wearing the masks. You don't know who's a killer, who isn't a killer, or what's happening at any point, whatever. They do all the stuff with the movie rules also in this movie, but then the, the, those don't actually apply like they usually do. So that was kind of annoying. They just kind of did it because they were obligated to. Um, and then they go up to the apartment or after the apartment killings, again, people survive that shouldn't survive that or just are alive too long. It just doesn't make sense. And so after that, they set up Gail because, well, not because, but it's like right, it's like right after the attacks at the apartment happens, the cops like blah, 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 and then everybody forgets about Gail. <laughs> Gail's alone at her house, and nobody does anything to help her. Um, and then they're on their way back to the theater to try to set up a trap, but then the whole subway scene happens, and that's great. And then they all figure out that it that they weren't setting up a trap, that they were trapped, and basically the cop was behind it the whole time. It was kind of dumb. Uh, it's fine. And then he starts acting way over the top, I will say, incredibly animated. It does kind of go in line with how the killers get revealed in the other movies, but I would say it got to Scream 3 pure comedy levels to where this isn't even a horror movie anymore. Um, 
But then Jenna Ortega and Melissa Barrera absolutely go off and they fuck everybody up. And it's kind of like Halloween, like 2018. Where it's just like they're, they're, they love that they're defending themselves and it's passionate and they enjoy it. And it almost gets like pleasurable for a second, which I like as an interesting wrinkle. That's kind of the thing. They half bake a lot of ideas in this. Just like I said, like even with the plot and characters themselves, there's just like not enough there that it even really. But then it just kind of happens and it's kind of like whatever. I don't really care. Um in a good or bad way. Like, she has a secret boyfriend. The reveal of that is kind of just like, whatever. You could have just made that her boyfriend. It didn't need to be a secret to anybody. It doesn't add anything to this. Uh, so kind of things like that. You know, where it's like, okay, so does she, like, does she love it? Can we make that like a plot line where she, like, loves it? And they kind of, they sprinkled it in here and there. Uh, they just kind of don't go all in with stuff, these new people. Um, they're more about brutality uh the stabs are a lot more aggressive again while they're up at the theater though one of the twins literally there's two ghost faces and he gets stabbed like 25 times survives just make him get stabbed less or make him not survive it's fine i I wish that they were bold enough to kill off these characters because again we've only really established jenna ortega and barely even her she's way more involved in this movie i feel like than in the last one but whatever the movie's really about melissa barrera's character and or the five was, but six, it's equally about both of them. They're the only ones who have any backstory or any anything. And sure, they kind of say it a little about the other people. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying, like, they're clearly just the two mains now. You know, whereas, like, Gail and Sydney were the two mains prior. They're the only ones that stayed in. You know, like, yeah, Dewey's, I guess Dewey, and but whatever. I guess I'm talking to myself out of it. But it was like Dewey and Gale became a couple, so that's, they're there, and then Sydney is the main, main character, right? But now it's like, oh, there's just four people, but two of them don't really matter and don't help and don't do anything of value. They just get stabbed, and they're kind of funny. They have good lines, you know, I, I guess you need that. Um, but it, it just doesn't need to be a full group of people. Maybe one of them could have died. Whatever. And then that's pretty much it. It ends. They they win. They kill him. Uh, you find out that it was two of their friends. One of them, their death was faked. And blah, blah, blah. Like, does it actually hold up if you really worked it out? I don't know. But this is much, this was much better than the fifth one. A very worthy entry into the series, no doubt. And listen, I'm ready for seven. No horror series is remotely close to being as strong as this one. Like, I- I'm talking about Scream 5 like I really, really hate it. Listen, if you put it on tonight, I'd watch it. And not be like upset. It's not unwatchable. It's just it has a lot of quality to live up to, you know. And it 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 wasn't successful to me, but it's still a fine movie. But it, it's the worst of the six, easily. And but six, I I I put that higher up. I I, I didn't do my re ranking, but I'd move that up in the ranking. You know, it doesn't, five and six to me are not the worst two movies. Five is just the worst one. Uh, And there's, so there's promise going forward. I don't know if in seven, maybe that's going to be more of the mentality. Uh, They seem to be hinting at it being that like Melissa Barrera is going to be the killer in the next one. I don't think that that'll necessarily happen. Um, But I do like, it could, I mean, don't get me wrong. I do like the idea of them both like enjoying killing people also though there's just going to be fun ways to wrinkle that in i don't know as far as predictability goes these movies are never predictable they're always whodunits so who done it in the next one there's no way to say you know i don't know what's going to happen next but i am excited to find out what can i say 
and made a fuck ton of money too. So these are not stopping anytime soon, that's for sure. But listen, this is what we need. This is all I've been trying to say. It's like, why make any of this shit if you're not going to do it well? Why reboot a thing if you're just doing it for the cash and you don't put any thought or effort or anything into any of this? You know, they're doing it a different style. Look, they're not Wes Craven. You can't just replicate Wes Craven. So you got to make it your own, but you still have to fit it within parameters. And I think that they're doing a mighty fine job of that. Um, n- no movie should be able to have six sequels where, or five sequels, I guess, you know, but where they hold up in quality this well, there shouldn't be able to be on a sixth one. Look at Rocky, you know, and the, if five effectively just isn't a reboot. I mean, sure. They added more characters, but that's it. It kind of is just a direct sequel with a bunch of new characters, which is what the fourth one was, you know, reboot just like wasn't a word when the fourth one came out. Um, Gail needs to die. She should have died. She survived her thing too. Everybody just survives no matter how brutally they get stabbed. Um, I thought it kind of might've been good if Gail just won the fight and like it ended there. That kind of could have been fun. Um, but the final killings did add a lot of gore and heft to the movie. But yeah, good stuff, good stuff. I know you like it when I hate things, but I just didn't hate this one. All right, I did hate this one, though. Last and certainly least, let's talk The Whale. Look, Brendan Fraser, love the guy, feel bad for him for whatever happened. I still don't really have all the details. Was this the best performance of the year? No, Colin Farrell deserved it. Listen, That's me being a fanboy for Colin Farrell, but this performance was not that special, I do have to say. Uh, This movie in no way is special. This was horrible. What the fuck? This was... Okay, listen. Darren Aronofsky, you are just a torture porn guy who masquerades himself as a high artist because you make fucking ridiculous movies. Requiem for a Dream, I don't know how anyone claims to like that movie. It's torture porn. It's unwatchable. The segments with the old lady literally like give me a headache. But that movie's gruesome and it's sad and to extreme levels. It's too much. Uh, the Wrestler is a masterpiece and I love it. And that's the blip. Black Swan, people loved it. I don't know how that aged well. I didn't see it. I don't care. But those two seem to be the outliers because everything else this guy has made is shit. Okay, he apparently made a movie about Noah, like Noah's Ark. I don't even remember this happening. Uh, Apparently it was okay. Whatever. Uh, Then he made that movie Mother that I think people hated. Whatever. Fuck this guy. This movie's just torture porn. Um... The only question this movie poses to the audience, which is what the audience wants to know, and it's what you want to know about everybody who weighs 600 pounds, is like, how the fuck did this happen? And the plot of the movie is slowly revealing why and how he got so fat. And that's it. It's not about anything else. This movie is literally just like, this guy's really fat. Want to know why? And that's it. And nothing in it works. Basically, he's an online English teacher who hides his face because he's a fat fucking cow. And uh, he has a friend who's a nurse and she keeps coming over to like help him with shit. And she's like, dude, you're going to die. I've been telling you you're going to die. Go to the hospital. And he's like, I don't have any money. And she's like, well, you're going to die, you stupid fuck. And then he calls his estranged daughter, hasn't seen her in 10 years. She comes by, she treats him like shit, complete and utter shit, shows no signs of being a remotely decent person in any capacity, okay? He then reveals to her that he has $120,000 that he's been saving because all he does is eat food and pay rent and he never leaves the house and never does anything else. And he's like, I'll do your homework for you if you take and if you just spend time with me. He doesn't reveal that it's his last week alive. Okay? She just keeps treating him like shit. She gives him sleeping pills so he can go to sleep. 
and then uh there's like this kid who's a christian and it it does nothing basically it doesn't add anything to the plot uh there's a pizza guy who he only communicates with the fo- through the phone because he's embarrassed for him to see him. Anyway, what the plot reveals is that this man had a kid with a woman. They were married, okay? He left her for a student of his that he was in love with, who was a man. That man is the nurse's sister, okay? He was very religious his father chastised him for all the things so the guy killed himself they also hint that he was starving himself like he developed an eating disorder and then he killed himself from being so depressed him killing himself then led brendan fraser down a spiral where he just binge ate and binge ate and cried and was sad so basically this guy wasn't even like fat who just stayed fat which let me tell you that's how people weigh 600 pounds okay They just keep fucking eating. They drink a two-eater every fucking day. They get two double quarter pounders with cheese, whole pizzas, and they just do it for the joy of the taste. You know? There's not like a tragic event or whatever. Okay? And then on top of that, throughout the movie, he just keeps reading this essay about Moby Dick over and over again. And it's revealed that the fucking daughter wrote it right before he abandoned her. And it's like his saving grace. And he's basically like, oh, no matter what I'm witnessing you do or how you treat people in person, you wrote this essay 10 years ago, so I think you're a good person. And basically, he is giving this girl 120 grand so he doesn't feel bad about both abandoning her and gaining a bunch of weight and being a monster. So he thinks that if he gives her 120 grand and does her homework, he can feel good about himself for a band. Like, no matter what, this guy sucks. He abandoned his daughter. And they just, oh, because he was in love. Cool. You could still see your daughter. And he's like, your mother wouldn't let me. And it's like, well, so you waited until you were about to die. Springboard back into her life. So and then die in front of her. That's how the movie ends. He dies in front of her. Uh, it's horrible in every way. There's nothing redeeming about it in any capacity. None of the characters are believable or their motivations or anything that happens. The nurse finds out that he had money the whole time and she's like, well, fuck you. Like, I needed help at one point. You could have just given me money. And he's like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> And you also could have just been to the hospital the whole time. And he's like, why well, I needed to give the money to her. And it's like, well, you could have just got healthy sooner and given her less money and she could have had a dad for more time. Like, no matter what, you're, you're making sure she doesn't have a dad. So, like, why come into her life at all? Just fucking leave her the money. You know, the whole thing is like, I need to feel good about myself for being a fat fuck horrible really just horrible in every way and for all the negative criticisms about it like i saw things that are like it should have had a fat guy play it again this is not what acting is you know they wanted somebody for my 600 pound life to star in a fucking movie like that's not how that works and creates a whole myriad of problems for the production (laughs) amongst many other things like you don't need to portray an obese person with an obese person i don't know why this is i don't know why (laughs) everybody turned yeah blackface isn't cool into you have to be gay to act gay brandon fraser is also not gay technically his character is gay did we need to find a 700 pound gay person specifically to play them like no that's not what the point of acting is you know Be smart, okay? (laughs) It's not that hard. (laughs) Don't portray something that's clearly going to offend people. Fat people exist, so portray them. It's not the same thing. This isn't what the argument for that stuff is. So the fact that that's a criticism of the film, I also hate. That's dumb. No, this thing's just shitty, poorly written, and not that thought through. Like, this seemed like the first draft of a script, and they just rolled with it. 
That's what I'm saying. Like, there's a, all the gaping holes I just pointed out and how unlikable pretty much everybody in the movie is. They just didn't address and do anything about it. And they made it and they made a fuck ton of movie money because it m- got Oscar nominations. So good for them. It was $5 to rent. I didn't pay for the theater shit. So kind of whatever. But fuck that movie. It wasn't good. Uh, see it to be mad and there's like some stuff in there where it is definitely just like trying to make you feel sick like they watch him shovel pizza into his face and it's like I you know who's this for what does this accomplish what is you know like I don't want to watch fat people eat I just don't. I said it to Justice last week. I don't. I wouldn't want to watch myself eat, and I weigh 450 less pounds than that guy. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just some, you know, whatever. Whatever. Again, I'm skinny in Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> that's what I like to say. And Texas, probably. Uh, but that movie sucked. It felt good to be fired up like that and rattle all that off. Somebody clip that and post it for me. Thank you. Run my socials. You know, rate, review, subscribe. This is Requiem for a Tuesday. I'm ending it abrupt. That's right. Uh, everything's linked in the description below. Check it out. Instagram at adam.rfat. You know the gist. And remember, I are fat. You are fat. We are fat.